guys and welcome to How to Gastro. In today's video, we're going to be talking about a very interesting topic and that is fasciolosis. So let's get started. So what is fasciolosis? Fasciolosis, also commonly known as the liver fluke disease, is caused by two species of parasitic flatworms called fasciola hepatica and fasciola gigantica. These flukes infect various parts of the body, including the blood vessels, the gastrointestinal tract, lungs, and liver, depending on the species. The disease affects humans, but its main hosts are cattle, sheep, water buffalo, and goats. So from this definition of fasciolosis, we get that it's caused by two main species of parasitic flatworms called fasciola hepatica and fasciola gigantica. So Gigantica is actually the more largest species of the two, hence the name Gigantica. And on the macroscopic aspect, to the naked eye, these flukes actually measure around 2 to 4 centimeters in length. So what actually happens is, once these parasites enter the body, these flukes actually infiltrate various organs of the body, including the blood vessels, the GI tract, the lungs and the liver. And in humans, another very common part that they affect is the gallbladder and the biliary duct system. So as this definition suggests, this disease does affect humans, but it's most commonly found in cattle, sheep, water buffalo and goats. But humans may be able to contract the disease. So now that we know what the basics of fasciolosis is, let's take a closer look at how one can contract this disease. So the actual life cycle of fasciolosis is pretty complex. It involves a final host, which is the adult human, where the worm lives, an intermediate host, where the larval stages of the worm develop, and a carrier, which entails suitable aquatic plants such as watercress. So the process starts when the infected animals, such as cattle, sheep, water buffalo and goats, defecate into freshwater sources. So if we take a closer look at this image on the right side of my screen, we see what the basic life cycle of this disease looks like. So we're going to begin here with the sheep and cattle. So it says ruminants are the typical definitive hosts. So from here we have the unembryonated eggs which are passed into the feces. So this is actually a fresh water source and the eggs become embryonated in the water. So since the worm lives in the bile ducts of such animals, its eggs are evacuated in the feces and hatch into larvae that lodge into a particular type of water snail. And this is actually the intermediate host. So once the eggs become embryonated in the water, the Myrcidia hatch from eggs and seek out a snail, which is the intermediate host, as we mentioned. And the Myrcidia actually penetrate the snail as the intermediate host. So now it says, once in the snail, the larvae reproduce and eventually release more larvae into the water. And these larvae swim into nearby aquatic or semi-aquatic plants where they attach to the leaves and stem and form small cysts, which is called the metasaccharae. So if we take a closer look back at our diagram, we have the sporocysts, the radii, and the saccharae, which all develop in the snail tissue. And then we have the free-swimming saccharae, which insist on the aquatic vegetation. So the most commonly known plant in which these saccharae insist are actually the watercress herbs. So now it says, when the plants with the small cysts attached are ingested by humans, they act as carriers of the infection. So watercress and watermint are good plants for transmitting fasciolosis, but insisted larvae may also be found on many other salad vegetables. So if we go back to our diagram, it says the metasaccharae on vegetation are ingested by a definitive host. And then we have the development of immature flukes, which insist in the duodenum, which is actually the first part of the small intestine, and penetrate the intestinal wall and migrate through the liver parenchyma and to the biliary ducts. So it actually infiltrates the liver, which is why it's called the liver fluke disease, and actually the biliary tree and the gallbladder as well. So this is the most common site of where these flukes can be found. And finally, number eight says the adult flukes can be found in the hepatic and biliary ducts. And that again are the fasciola hepatica and fasciola gigantica flukes, which can be found and seen with the naked eye. So just to mention the last point in our word box, it says the ingestion of free metasaccharia floating on the surface of the water, possibly detached from the carrier plants, such as the waterman to watercress, may also be a possible mode of transmission. So if humans go and drink from this freshwater source, they may also actually drink these little free metasaccharia 
and in this way they can also develop the infection. So it doesn't just mean that these cysts are just found on these water plants and this is the only way in which the human can get the infection by ingesting these plants. They can also get this infection by drinking out of this water which is contaminated with the fasciola species. So now that we know how one contracts this disease, let's take a close look at the signs and symptoms in humans. So in humans, in acute infections, the immature flukes will migrate through the intestinal wall, the peritoneal cavity, the liver capsule, and the parenchyma of the liver before entering the biliary ducts where they can mature into adulthood in about three to four months. So if we take a closer look at this image to the left of my screen, we see these leafy-like structures found in various parts of this liver tissue. And this is actually the infiltration of these various flukes within the parenchyma of the liver. And this usually takes around three to four months for them to develop into this adult stage. So during this time, the patient suffers from abdominal pain, hepatomegaly, which means the enlargement of the liver, nausea, vomiting, an intermittent fever, eutrochoria, eosinophilia, which is actually an increase in the white blood cells, the specific type called the eosinophils, and this is the body's basic response to a parasitic infection. We usually have elevated levels of white blood cell eosinophils. The patient will also suffer from malaise and weight loss due to the liver damage. So the patients may also become chronically infected, and in these cases, they may be asymptomatic, or the infection can lead to intermittent abdominal pain, cholelithiasis, which is actually the formation of gallstones within the gallbladder, cholangitis, which is the inflammation of the biliary ducts. They can have obstructive jaundice. If the flukes actually block one of those biliary trees, there will be an obstruction in the flow of bile and therefore the onset of obstructive jaundice. And they may also suffer from pancreatitis. Heavy infections can cause sclerosing cholangitis and biliary cirrhosis, which means the fibrosis of the biliary tree. And ectopic lesions may occur in the intestinal wall, the lungs, or in other organs. So now let's talk about the diagnosis of fasciolosis. So the first thing we can do is the antibody assays. So we can look for specific antibodies against the parasite in the blood. We can also do a microscopic examination of the stool or the duodenal or biliary material for eggs. And this is actually what a fasciola species egg looks like on microscopy. And this will be the classical picture that can be used to diagnose this disease. And we can also do a CT. And the CTs frequently show us hypodense lesions in the liver during the acute states of fasciolosis. And the ultrasound, CT, MRI, and endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, or ERCP, or a cholangiography can detect biliary tree abnormalities in chronic disease. So if we take a closer look at this image on the right side of my screen, it's actually an image of an enhanced abdominal CT finding in a 46-year-old woman with fasciolosis on admission. The white arrows, which are here, show multiple nodular cysts with tubular branching. So we have these multiple nodular cysts with tubular branching. And finally, let's talk about the treatment of fasciolosis. So several drugs are effective for fasciolosis, both in humans and in domestic animals. The drug of choice in the treatment of fasciolosis in humans is triclobendazole, which is given 10 milligrams per kg of the person orally once with food. Alternatively, treatment may be done with nitazoxanate, 500 mg orally, given twice a day for 7 days. And that brings us to the end of this video on fasciolosis. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you found the presentation very interesting and informative. Please make sure to like, comment, subscribe and share. And please make sure you turn on your bell notifications so you'll be notified every time we have a new upload. If you'd like to download a copy of this presentation, you may do so by clicking the link in the description. Take care and bye for now.